Welcome back to Harbour Unbox. Today we are once again talking about the RTX 3080 and the stability issues that pretty much everyone's been talking about. But this time we do have some concrete info backed up with some actual testing. But rather than just benchmark the new driver and compare it to the older version that we used in our review, I want to talk about this entire drama, start to finish, and also discuss some of the comments we've seen from viewers. So this video is going to have a bit of everything. And with that, I think we should probably start from the very start. About a week before the RTX 3080 reviews were set to go live, we had our Founders Edition sample in hand, along with access to the review driver. And as you might imagine, I set about testing as soon as possible, as we had quite a lot to cover. And I actually ended up completing my review with a few days to spare, so that was unexpected, but it did allow me to move on to some CPU and PCIe comparisons. Now, at this point, I hadn't run into a single stability issue. All of our benchmarking went off without a hitch, and the night before the RTX 3080 reviews were set to go live, I took a bit of a break for the first time in just over a week and actually played some games with the RTX 3080 installed in my personal system, which was previously running an RX 5700 XT without any issues, I might add. With a few hours to burn before the reviews went live, I enjoyed the amazing performance of the RTX 3080 for a few hours in some games and didn't run into any issues. And the next night I was keen to play some more games because it was a hell of a lot of fun. Uh, but this time, about an hour into my gaming session, I ran into my first crash. So the system crashed to the desktop. I then loaded back in and it was about 30 to 40 minutes later that it crashed again and once more to the desktop. And then I loaded in about another 30 minutes, I crashed again. So at that point I was a bit frustrated and I just gave up and went back to doing some actual work and I thought I'd investigate tomorrow. So the next day I DDU'd the drivers and I started afresh. Long story short though, that didn't help solve the random crashes with the FE model. So I removed it and installed the ASUS Tough Gaming. I suspected maybe there was something with GDDR6X memory temperatures getting too high on the FE model. Wasn't really sure, but I thought a quick way to diagnose that is to install the ASUS Tough Gaming. Unfortunately though, the following night's gaming session saw the system crash to desktop once more after about an hour. And if anything, I saw more crashing when using the Tough Gaming. So again, very frustrating. Now, at this point, I really do need to stress that I had no idea what the problem was. I did suspect drivers, but it really could have been anything that was just a purely a guess. And it really could have even been an issue with my own system that, you know, things can go wrong at any point in time. So it could have been a coincidence that it happened when I installed the 3080. That it was always that sort of possibility. Uh, that said, also around the same time, user reports started to surface with similar stories of games crashing to the desktop. So therefore it was becoming quite apparent that the issue wasn't just limited to my system, but also it still wasn't apparent what the actual issue was. So shortly after seeing a flood of user reports, many tech media outlets started looking for the cause. And one such media outlet, Igor's Lab, received a lot of attention for an article titled The Possible Reason for Crashes and Instabilities of NVIDIA GeForce RTX 3080 and 3090. It was a very interesting article, and it noted that the capacity configuration behind the GPU as being a possible cause. Again, I really have to emphasize that the title did state that this was a possible reason for the crashes, and it certainly didn't suggest that it was the reason, the, the only reason. Now, Igor pointed out that the NVIDIA base spec calls for six polymer tantalum solid capacitors located behind the GPU for power filtering. However, Higher quality models like NVIDIA's own Founders Edition only uses four of these capacitors with a series of much smaller MLCC or multi-layer ceramic chip capacitors. He speculated that MLCC arrays could be required to avoid the crashing some users were reporting and therefore it was possible NVIDIA messed up with the base spec. Now, I'm not going to dive into how these capacitors differ. There's already been far too much talk about capacitors when it comes to these new RTX graphics cards. I just wanted to explain what's happened to date. But I will quickly summarize by saying MLCCs are better at handling a higher frequency range because you guessed it, they react faster. Polymer tantalum solid capacitors, on the other hand, are slower, but can be better under certain conditions. Therefore, it's been suggested to us by engineers who actually know what they're talking about, that it's likely that a mix of both of these components is the best configuration as they do complement one another. Though they also noted that there's far more factors that need to be considered. Quite shockingly, this stuff is very complex and simply looking at the back of the board to see if POS caps or MLCCs are used uh, doesn't give you the full picture. 
Also, as a side note, DeBauer created an excellent experiment showing that at least one MLCC array can improve the stability of an RTX 3080 graphics card when running above the stock clocks. And this is likely the reason why factory OC models feature these capacitors, and even Gigabyte's own gaming OC model uses higher quality polymer tantalum capacitors than Nvidia's base spec calls for. There's also some other noteworthy changes that people are overlooking when discussing the gaming OC model, but we'll cover that when we review the card, but needless to say, it is well over spec. It's also super important to note that just a single model shipped to customers with the base spec configuration, and that was the Zotac Trinity. So unfortunately, Zotac seems to have caught a lot of potentially unnecessary flack over that. They really are guilty of nothing more than following the NVIDIA guidelines for their base model, and NVIDIA would have signed off on Zotac's design. Anyway, this all got a bit out of hand when a large tech YouTuber, who I'm not going to mention by name, jumped on the back of Igor's theory and put it out there that the capacitors were squarely to blame for the stability issues. The story blew up, and before long, everyone was talking about bloody capacitors. Now, I just want to mention that I saw Igor's report before any YouTubers jumped on it, and it was fairly interesting. I don't think it warranted a video, but it was quite interesting. And as Igor said, it's certainly possible that it was a cause as it turns out, for very, very limited amount of models. But it was obvious that it, it wasn't a silver bullet. It was very obvious to me anyway that this wasn't the reason why so many people were reporting stability issues. And that's because so many users who were reporting these stability issues were doing so on models with one or more MLCC array. Even the Tough Gaming, which uses MLCC capacitors exclusively. And it really is worth noting that this information was already available online. There were plenty of user reports of Founders Edition, Tough Gaming, and many other models with MLCC capacitors that were crashing to desktop, and fortunately, I did see this firsthand, so I was confident the reports were accurate. And that being the case, it was a little bit baffling to me as why capacitors were all of a sudden the talk of the town, with POS caps being bad and MLCC good. After all, a very small amount of research would have revealed that ASUS only uses MLCC, while we've got MSI, EVGA, Galax, GameWid, Palette, and Inno3D all using a mix. So configurations that were meant to be issue-free, or at the very least not suffer from this potential capacitor problem. At the time, I put out a tweet explaining that we didn't believe the crashing was just down to capacitors used, but we also had no idea what the exact cause was, and we really didn't care to guess in a video, so we didn't make a video. In part two of that tweet, I also said that from our initial assessment, it looks more like a core clock speed issue, but again, emphasized that we just don't have enough info yet, and also noted it could just as easily be a driver issue. From that point, the capacitor story spiraled out of control and misinformation spread like wildfire, and that is despite no one really seeming to know exactly what the issue was. It's also extremely difficult for us to get to the bottom of stability issues like these, especially if they don't happen during an entire gaming session that lasts multiple hours, while other times we can fire it up and have a crash with inside of an hour. It's certainly not something that we're going to nail down after a few days of troubleshooting, and it really is a community effort. Speaking of which, our mate Nick over at Gear Seekers, who was seeing frequent crashes, uh, much more frequently than I was, discovered something quite interesting. And for those wondering, he was testing with the ASUS ROG Strix 3090, Gigabyte 3080 and 3090 Gaming OC, and the MSI Gaming X Trio 3080. Now, Nick was thinking pretty much along the same lines as myself, that it is likely a driver issue. So he did something quite creative and used Linux to test the stability and found that all these crashing problems were solved with no changes to performance or boost clocks. He also noted that the most unstable cards for him did indeed use MLCC capacitors, and therefore suggested that it was likely a driver issue, and the whole POSCAP versus MLCC thing might be debunked. Which again is exactly what I thought from the start, given reports from users, and of course my own first-hand experiences. So just blaming capacitors really was a bad, poorly researched choice. Anyway, given Nick's findings and some chatter that I was hearing from AIBs, it seemed pretty likely that an updated driver from NVIDIA would solve the issue. And I'm very happy to report, for me at least, that has been the case. I've also followed up with Nick and he's no longer seeing any stability issues in Windows using the latest NVIDIA driver. And it's also quite interesting to note that NVIDIA never issued a new Linux driver. So it seems very clear that there was an error with the Windows driver. So that's great news. But of course, we go from one drama to the next with this stuff, 
At least that's how it seems at the moment. Shortly after Nvidia released their new driver, we started seeing reports from users, almost certainly people who have never used an RTX 3080, that the fix was to downclock the GPU and therefore cripple performance in order to achieve stability. A quick retest with the new driver didn't seem to indicate that that was the case, but I decided to look a bit closer. The new driver does certainly seem to alter the voltage slash clock curve, dropping the frequency targets by as much as 1.5%, so certainly not a big change, and I can't imagine that will influence frame rates in a meaningful way, let alone cripple them, but let's take a look. Here we're comparing the 456.16 review driver with the brand new 456.55 driver that addresses the stability issues by altering the voltage slash clock curve. Here we're seeing no change in performance when testing with MSI's RTX 3080 Gaming X Trio, a factory OC model. All the results are within margin of error. It's also well worth noting that the observed boost frequency in games appeared to be the same with both drivers, so there's really nothing more to say here. The performance seen in the day one reviews still stands, and there's no reason for any further retests at this point in time. And just finally, here's a look at power consumption of just the graphics card in Shadow of the Tomb Raider, again using the MSI RTX 3080 Gaming X Trio. This data is based on a three run average and the data collected begins after a 10 minute warm up period. Here we're seeing a two watt reduction in average power consumption and a four watt drop in the peak. And this was highly repeatable. There does appear to be slightly less fluctuation now, which has helped to stabilize the boost algorithm and I believe eliminate spikes under lighter loads that were causing the crashes. Okay, so we've now compared the driver performance. We also found no stability issues with the 456.66 driver. So I think it is time to close the book on capacitors. And it also seems like Nvidia agrees as they said this in an official statement. Regarding partner board designs, our partners regularly customize their designs and we work closely with them in the process. The appropriate number of POSCAT versus MLCC groupings can vary depending on the design and it's not necessarily indicative of quality. So this further suggests that the whole capacitor story was blown well out of proportion for what ultimately ended up being an issue with the Windows 10 driver, something we strongly suspected from the very start. As a side note, I've seen some people pointing to Debauer's video as evidence that it was indeed a capacitor issue, but Debauer didn't see any change in stability at the stock clocks. He found that MLCC caps helped to achieve slightly higher clock frequencies when overclocking the RTX 3080s beyond the factory spec. So again, this would be a reason why the factory OC models were upgraded beyond the base Nvidia spec. So at this point in time, I'm satisfied that the issue has been addressed and nothing needs to be added or updated from the original review. And we've known from day one that these cards are right on a knife's edge in terms of clock speeds with virtually no overclocking headroom for improving performance, at least if you validate your OC correctly. Again, the capacitor story really was blown massively out of proportion and unfortunately led to many people unnecessarily cancelling their order and missing out on what's proving to be a very difficult product to purchase due to extreme demand. Also, I'd just like to say that before someone tries to make the argument that capacitors were the issue because, insert reasons, it's worth noting that had no one pointed at capacitors as a potential problem, and Nvidia began with the 456.55 driver version, none of this conversation would have ever taken place, and virtually no one watching this video would have known how the capacitor configurations behind the GPU differ, or that they differ at all, or that they're even capacitors. It wouldn't have mattered because ultimately it doesn't matter for the vast majority of users who are just going to install a graphics card in their system and get gaming. Anyway, moving on from that, there is no questioning that Nvidia rushed to this release. That's evidenced by stuff like the limited stock and of course the buggy Windows driver. Uh, they've now fixed the latter and we hope to see supply pick up soon. And just finally, I'd like to address the criticism that tech media unfairly give poor old little AMD a hard time over buggy display drivers but then don't do the same for big old bad NVIDIA. Honestly, that is just an absurd claim to make with zero supporting evidence. For the past week, all anyone could talk about, most media included, were the Ampere stability issues, and we even made a video discussing the concerns a week after launch. Compare that with the seven months it took us to cover the Navi driver issues, so 
28 weeks. That's more than one week. And I've also talked about the challenges faced for accurately diagnosing stability issues. And in the case of Navi, I didn't actually see the same issues others were, which made it very difficult to report on them. But about six months after the release, it became clear that there were some problems and AMD even admitted as much. In the case of Ampere, as I said, I didn't know what the problem was. So prematurely making a video about how we think it's this or it's that, as we've seen, it doesn't really help anyone, does it? It just creates a whole lot of confusion, misinformation, and it's not worth it to drum up a few quick views. But the point is, very little content was made about the Navi driver issues, while we've seen a flood of content talking about the Ampere problems just one week after release. Anyway, we're closing the book on this one. The issues appear to be solved now. They are on our end. I haven't seen any more crashing, and I'm hearing the same is true from others, like Nick from Gearseekers, for example. So I hope this video helps clear up this mess for those of you who were confused. And if so, make sure you give it a like and you can subscribe for more content from us. Also, you can join us over on Patreon. I did talk about a lot of these issues before I brought them to the main channel, actually much earlier than I brought them to the main channel uh, because as I, I, I'm a bit more frank with our Patreon members. I feel I can speak a bit more freely and people don't take it out of context and start posting things over forums. Basically, I was saying that we don't think it's capacitors. It seems to be a driver slash clock speed related issue to us. And I created a behind the scenes video talking about all of this. So if you're interested, sign up and you get access to stuff like our exclusive Discord chat, monthly live streams where we also talked about this. And yeah, anyway, if you're interested, link for Patreon is in the video description. But otherwise, just thank you very much for watching this video. I'm your host, Steve, and I'll see you again next time.